Well, I've been around for quite a while. And when I first came into the field of psychotherapy, the world of the mind and the world of the brain were worlds apart. And we in the psychotherapy field didn't talk about the brain. No one did. In the early 80s, we got the Prozac, the SSRI drugs. So we started talking about brain chemistry a little bit. And the only person that was really um, talking at all about the brain was this kind of dark horse, Daniel Amen, who was kind of a commercial guy who started scanning people's brains. And he said kind of contemptuously that we're the only profession that doesn't even look at the organ we treat. We don't even look under the hood. And before the decade of the brain, which started in 1990, um, we didn't. So Daniel Amen first put the brain on the psychological map. Then we got Alan Shore, who talked about the way the infant brain resonates and develops with the mother's brain, but it didn't really penetrate. It didn't really go very far in our psychotherapy field until Bessel van der Kolk came out with this research that absolutely blew my mind and changed my whole way of thinking about everything. And I'm going to take you through this in some detail because I think it is so important for us as we understand the work with trauma and neglect. So I'm going to ask you to look at this brain. And this is a mirror image of the brain. What Bessel's team did was they recruited a group of heroic trauma survivors who came in, they gave their trauma story. The trauma story was written down, transcribed. Their transcripts were read back to them, and they went into a full-blown trauma state, a flashback state, and then they went into the scanner. And this is what the brain scans showed. This is a mirror image of the brain. So what you see on the right side is the... Um, is the left hemisphere and what you see on the right on the left is the right hemisphere and at the top is the front of the brain at the bottom is the back of the brain the orbital area the visual cortex and the the front part of the brain the prefrontal area is where we have our executive function of the brain that's where cognition resides that's where logic reason autobiographical narrative, language, memory, all the main cognitive functions exist and kind of operate in this prefrontal area in the front there. On the right-hand side, which is the left hemisphere, you see in that front area on the outer side, that's called Broca's area, and that's speech expression. The inner area that's dotted is called Wernicke's area. That's speech comprehension. This is the speech center of the brain. That back part is the orbital. That's the visual cortex. And this is what they saw when the survivors went into the scanner. You see the, the whole front thinking part of the brain is dark. Nothing is firing at all. You see the whole speech center on the left there, on, well, it's the right on that, on that picture. Um, the speech center is completely dark. Nothing is firing at all. You've got a little bit of, of activation in the orbital, the visual cortex. And what do you see that's all lit up? It's the right limbic area, which is the fight-flight response. This person is in speechless terror. They can't speak. They can't think. This person is running from a tiger. So you think about this infant 
whose mother has withdrawn or whose mother is gone in terror, can't think or speak or get away. There's no story there. There's simply this speechless terror which fills their whole little body. That is what happens in trauma. So what does that mean for talk therapy? How do we talk with somebody who's in that state? By definition, trauma is overwhelming experience. The stimulus is greater than what the organism can process and store and make sense out of and give put language to in its customary ways, which is why trauma memory is so distorted, if it's even there. So that is what trauma means, and that's what's going on in the brain. This person is completely hyper-aroused. They feel like they're going to burst with activation. And if they can't run like an infant can, they're just sort of filled with this energy. What? Where does it go? What happens? Well, then we began to learn something more. I'll never forget the experience of when I was at this conference in 2003, and there was a young medical student, a recently graduated young doctor who presented this research, and she talked about this couple that was in a car accident. And it was one of those pileup accidents where one car sort of crashes into another, into another, into another, like a domino effect, and people were getting trapped in their cars. So this couple got trapped in their car and the husband went into high gear. He broke out the window on his side of the car, ran around the car, broke the window, pulled his wife out of the car, ran to the side of the road. And just in time before the car burst into flames, they were safe. And so up above on the first layer of, of brain scans, you see the, the husband's brain. And there's quite a bit of activation in different areas in his brain. And because he, he became really active in purposeful action. And there was agency, there was movement, there was, you know, excitement, and there was success. So there was a lot going on in that man's brain and body. The wife, you see her brain below. And I remember when this slide was flashed on the screen and I was in this room full of several hundred therapists like me and we'd never seen anything like this. And the whole room just went, <gasps> we gasped because it looked like the brain of a dead person. There is nothing firing there. This person froze. She couldn't fight or flee, so she went into immobility. She went into a hypo-aroused response. This is how we began to learn about the freeze response and hypo-arousal and what happens when one can't fight or flee. And what we know from the animal world is... When a prey animal is cornered, trapped by a predator, and they feel like they're, they're going to get eaten, there's nothing they can do, they can't get away. Well, very few predators, with a couple of exceptions, buzzard and buzzards and turkey vultures, most predators don't eat dead animals. So sometimes an animal will play possum, so to speak. And they'll play dead, hoping that the predator will lose interest and run away. And if they're not that lucky, then they numb out and lose all sort of sensation and they ratchet down all their body functioning to the bare minimum so they won't feel the pain of being eaten. This is hypo-arousal and what we now understand as dissociation. 
So this is the under-firing brain. And you'll hear more about what the under-firing brain is. But what we know is with neglect, with that infant who we met in the last segment, where there's no one there to resonate to, and they go into terror instead, parts of the brain don't begin to get activated. That default mode network, which emerges through the resonance, doesn't wake up. So that brain is firing slow. That brain is under firing. And what we see later is the prefrontal area is slow. The frequencies at which that brain is functioning is under, is slow. And that child grows up having attention issues. And so what do we do? We slap them on amphetamines and we've got a generation of kids growing up on speed. So we've got these under-firing brains that actually come out of this neglect experience. This is really important because that terrible experience of life-threatening loneliness, emptiness, that void, that terror, the under-firing brain, the underdeveloped sense of self, this kind of slow function of the brain we start to see. And one of the things I came to identify really early as one of the giveaway, the dead giveaway, and no pun intended when I say dead giveaway, the dead giveaway about there being a neglect history. And I hear these complaints so often from partners of neglect survivors, what I call the three Ps of neglect, passivity, procrastination, and paralysis. It's very hard for these people to initiate, especially in the interpersonal, to follow through and complete things, and they tend to collapse. They tend to kind of drop into despairing hopelessness, into inaction, where the survivor of trauma, of shock trauma, tends to go into overactivity, hyperarousal. The survivor of this freeze response tends to shut down, shut in, go inactive, unemotional, numb. They don't, they don't function. They don't act. They're more prone to depression than anxiety, but they, they will have both. So another thing, and this is another dead giveaway about neglect, and this is one of the things that I came to recognize as another signature marker, and this is what I will call the spoiler alert, but I won't, I won't tell you what it is yet. This is a really common refrain. They say, I don't know what to do. There is nothing I can do. What do I do? And they go into this pleading mode of helplessness, powerlessness, and they will often make their partners very crazy because they appear to be so helpless when their partner thinks, you should know what to do. I don't want to have to tell you. And they truly feel, and there's a shrug that goes with it. There's nothing I can do. What do I do? And I learned to spot them a mile away when I heard those words like, ah, there's an indicator. There's a marker, a signature. That person has this history. And when there's no connection, and we all know about this when we have a broken heart, when there's no connection, it feels like life loses its meaning. Nothing matters. There's nothing I can do. 
I have no impact. I make no difference. I don't matter. Nothing matters. Hopelessness, despair, ennui, depression, meaninglessness, suicide. These are all sequelae of this wide world of nothing, of nothingness. So what I want you to really take away from this segment is nothing is not nothing. <laughs>